first, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was told uh, to do a TED Talk in five minutes, um, and I just settled on trying to do something in five minutes because I had to look up what a TED Talk, how to do a TED Talk. Um, I just want to, you know, really just kind of convey what my experience has been trying to be the, the climate extension guy um, in the Northwest, um, and kind of starting off with some things that, you know, really, frankly, didn't work. Um, and then kind of narrowing in on what feels like maybe some areas where I've gotten some traction uh, with a lot of the clientele that Extension works with. So I want to start, and I'm actually surprised that this hasn't come up yet, uh, you know, just thinking about the, the election. And I'm not going to talk about the, the politics of the election, uh, but I read a, a really, um, for me, it was a very resonating quote uh, from a guy named David Brooks who writes for the New York Times. And he was kind of uh, lamenting the, the kind of the acrimony that is taking place in kind of the, the current politics um, and kind of talking about how uh, unfortunate it is that we've lumped ourselves into one of two buckets uh, politically. Um, you know, he kind of says, you know, we've, we've basically gotten uh, either lazy or we're besieged, uh, but we've somehow, uh, you know, reduced ourselves into, into one category politically. And in my mind, that kind of reminded me of, in some ways, what the, the climate debate looked like when I started this job. Um, and, you know, and, you know, shortly after, you know, kind of an inconvenient truth, uh, there was this idea that, um, you know, either Al Gore was, you know, kind of the devil and reincarnate, or maybe he was uh, the messiah. And it was unfortunate because, uh, from my standpoint, uh, it basically attached a political agenda to, to kind of both sides of these issues. Um, and you know, as we as we know, and hopefully as we're learning, climate impacts don't really have political boundaries, right? It's going to be affecting kind of all of these systems that our clientele re rely on. So. You know, I would argue that the space that has been more successful for me is trying to, to work in this area that really is in between these areas um, and, it, and, and not to be pulled to these extreme ends in the conversation. Um, one of the things that has worked for me is to be trying to think about you know, how a lot of these global climate projections, um, you know, things that I wheeled out to the communities and, and these irrigation conferences when I first started, uh, that don't actually mean a whole lot to a producer. Um, you know, in a, in a particular county in, say, Idaho. What matters is how does that change actually influence or intersect with their lives or their livelihoods or their communities? Um, and so we start to be thinking about these useful metrics or yardsticks that we can put across the landscape or ask of the climate data that actually have some meaning for some of these systems. Uh, and then the last part is kind of in the true extension format is what can we actually do about it, right? What are some best management practices that we can apply to some of these landscapes? So some of the, 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 the analysis that has worked for us are starting to ask questions of the data. For example, how will the timing of a harvest change, in this case in Wenatchee, Oregon, of, or uh, Wenatchee, Washington, for apples, as the cumulative growing degree days occur earlier in the season? Another one from a project we did in central Idaho, uh, potatoes are a big deal there was you know, concern about heat stress. How will, you know, in this case, we, we chose days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, how that might change with three different climate scenarios through time, trying to present some meaning to the risks of some of these global uh, climate projections that we're experiencing. From an irrigation perspective, we've done some work trying to think about how the water supplies may change. Uh, for irrigation, and here we're looking at uh, kind of the high-end climate uh, change scenario and how the, the timing of stream flow is occurring much earlier in the year. And I'll just kind of close with this, this last uh, chart here. Here we're actually trying to understand how um, changes in supply and changes in uh, irrigation demand for different cropping systems may come together and the experience of water scarcity under future climate change, and what is the role of management. And so in this case, we're looking at two futures, uh, that variability, the bands, the width of those bands represent the climate uncertainty, the green and the blue represent uh, differences in irrigation efficiency investments, changes in cropping systems, basically things that we can control on the landscape. Um, in other words, if we inf invest in management, we can uh, really kind of reduce uh, the acuity of some of these water scarcity problems that we may be experiencing under climate change. 
And so I'll just wrap up here. From my experience was try not to get pulled into these extreme ends of uh, you know what I would call climate identity politics. Uh, try to focusing on a little bit more of the middle ground. Um, and some successful strategies for me were really trying to understand the role of climate in people's lives today and then how that may change going into the future. Um, again, focusing in on meaning of the data through context. So thinking about what are the important growing degree thresholds, what are the important heat stress thresholds, what are the important irrigation demand requirements and how those may change through time. Uh, and then ultimately begin thinking about how can we start to respond uh, effectively so to some of these changes. And I think that's it.